Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we are watching Star Trek Voyager from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 1, Episode 3, because last week was 1 and 2 together. Yeah, that makes everything so confusing. I know. This episode is called Parallax, and it aired January 23rd, 1995, which of course means that's how long, at least how long we've known each other. (laughs) So before we start talking about this one, do you have anything to say about last week's episode? We did cut down on the over-analysis because we decided to keep it under eight hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was long. That's too long. I can't record for that long and still have anything to say. I like lose my mind. (laughs) It gets too hot in here. I get tired. And also I was under a bunch of stress last week and I don't feel like I was as energetic as I normally am. Oh, I thought it was good. Okay. Mostly what I remember is talking about the stairs. (laughs) There was a lot of talking about the stairs. They were an important character in that episode. Oh, they really were. I think there's going to be more analysis on this one because I'm going to bring up stuff that I didn't in that one. Well. I will give a little warning to you and I guess to the listeners. This is going to be a leadership heavy podcast. You may want to prepare yourself oh. for that. What's funny is rewatching this, I'm going, oh, Kim is going to have so much to say about leadership. Yeah. And I'm not even going to wait till the end. I have it <laughs> right when things happen. I have things to say about it. Well, are you ready to get going? I have the notes this week. Okay. Over to you, Kim. We open in sick bay with Lieutenant Carey ranting to Tuvok and Chakotay that Belana hit him and broke his nose in three places. It seems like, at least according to his story, he was being reasonable and she punched him. She is a Klingon. Every time he sits up to complain, the doctor slams him back down to the bed and he quietly says, ow, which, <laughs> which after like the third time, I was like, that is very funny. I believe the doctor's bedside manner is a little more functional than compassionate. Yes. Then we go to Tuvok and Chakotay. They're like walking and talking through the hallway. And Tuvok thinks Belana should be in the brig for what she's done. And Chakotay, he's a bit of an ass in this scene, I think, to Tuvok, saying he shouldn't have to explain himself to Tuvok. I mean, I'm sorry, but yes, you do have to explain yourself. As we fall right into the Janeway leadership corner, just right out of the gate, (laughs) Tuvok is, he's following regulations. He's quoting the book. He's basically doing his job. It's your job as the leader to get Tuvok on board with you, not just tell him, oh, it's none of your business what I do. It's like, it's not a pirate ship. I mean, maybe that's what Chakotay is used to. Well, that would be my defense of Chakotay in this moment. He has not completed the adjustment. I guess not. But he does treat others differently later. But I guess that's really just the members of his old crew. I mean, if we were looking at it like this is the military, the commander commands. But I'm talking about if you want to get people to follow you willingly, not just because they have to, to get the most out of people, you don't tell them that, oh, I'm in charge, so you just shut the hell up. That will not work, even with a Vulcan, because you're not building any kind of rapport or trust between the two of you. Yeah. And trying to keep it away from the captain, I feel is a poor command decision. On day one of your new job. That's a terrible decision. Well, I think an important part of this episode, though, is this Chakotay starting to get back into the Federation Starfleet mindset. Remember, he had been trained as a Starfleet officer. So I think he's probably spent too much time being a marquee pirate behaving in that way. So you need an adjustment period. Yeah. Well, and it's not even just him. There's the Janeway side of it as well. This is at least the first step in them trying to figure out how to work together and to intermingle the crews for sure. But I think he's making a mistake in this conversation with Tuvok. Yeah, I think that it's probably muscle memory. Look, this is how I work within the Marquis. And he's just looking at Tuvok as he's just another Marquis subordinate. Yeah, Tim Russ is really good in the scene, I think. <laughs> yeah. He just goes, okay, I will <laughs> yield to your authority. And he just turns and walks away. And it's just very Vulcan. Yeah, oh, very. I'm surprised he didn't put his hand up behind him doing the live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Jackass. Well, then we do see Chicote pivot a bit when a couple of the Maquis turn up to tell him about the rumors they've been hearing. And they tell Chicote that they're ready to help take over Voyager. Yeah. And Chicote tells them to knock it off or he'll put them in the brig for mutiny. And then he heads over to Bellana's quarters. That was a good thing he was doing there. I think it shows that they're still very fractious. I mean, I assume they're just days after they were at the array that this is all happening. 
Well, you don't change your opinions about something just because your uniform changes, right? That's true. Yeah. Not only will it take time, but it's going to take good good leadership to get you out of that mode. Intro over analysis. Well, I think there must be an awful lot of resentment from the Marquis. I mean, it's amazing it's working even in the first place because their colonies were hung out to dry by the Federation. They were used as bargaining chips in a really bad treaty with the Cardassians. Yes. And I think that would leave a lasting impact of like, these are the people who screwed me, my family, my peoples over. Yeah, but at the same time, not these exact people. And you are stuck out in the middle of nowhere with them. Yeah. So I guess you do have to find a way to compartmentalize it. But you don't just get over hate. Yes. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like just getting over racism all of a sudden. Yeah. There's not an overnight process. So I suppose they should be commended for they actually managed to get this far without resorting to a firefight on the bridge and in the corridors. Probably true. Well, now Chakotay does do something useful. Yeah. Maybe this is because he knows how to talk to Belana, but when she starts ranting about Lieutenant Carey, the guy that she punched and calling him an idiot, he says that she's really turned this into one lousy day for him. <laughs> and I like this technique of turning the tables a bit and saying, yeah, you're upset, but look what you're doing to me. And I'm just trying to help you. That can be very effective. It's your goal to ruin my life. <laughs> yes. I'm pretty sure I've had that conversation (laughs) with someone. It really does require quite a level of trust between the two of you to be able to say something like that. Otherwise, the person's going to go, what do I care about you? (laughs) Have you seen what's happening to me? Oh, well, it looks like my objectives have been fulfilled then. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. My plan has worked. Yeah. (laughs) He also tells her here that she needs support from the Voyager crew if she's going to become chief engineer. This stops her in her tracks and makes her chill out for a minute. This is also an effective leadership technique. This is what I mean, where he's really good in this scene as a leader after, you know, the previous scene with Tuvok. This is an effective technique where you show absolute faith in someone, even though you're arguing with them or you're having some sort of a disagreement. Exhibiting that belief in the person can really turn somebody's attitude around quickly. I've absolutely used that technique. Yeah. But regardless of what he does here with Bolana, there's no excuse for how he talked to Tuvok. There is the animosity aspect, though, with Tuvok. He was on his crew, he did trust him, and turned out to be an undercover security officer for Starfleet. So that, I think, might add an additional layer of, I really don't like you. Maybe, but you're in a high-ranking position. You gotta pull your crap together. Yeah. So your summary is, suck it up. Yeah, suck it up. Totally. A thing that I say all the time is, you're a leader all the time. It, it's not just when you feel like it. Yeah. If you can't do it all the time, you're in the wrong job. We go into the intro now, and I have to comment. I really like the part where Voyager is flying over the rings of that large planet, and you can like see Voyager reflected. I think that is just the killer shot. Hmm. I actually watched the opening for that shot. <laughs> I see. Okay. I may have press the skip button this time. I can't remember. (laughs) I do love the theme, but if I listen to it too many times, I won't like it anymore. Next, we go to a senior staff meeting where we're talking about repairing all of the damage on Voyager without the help of a starbase. We establish that we can't turn off the holodecks to get more power because the energy matrix isn't compatible with the other systems. So this is obviously how we keep the holodecks available for future episodes, even though it really doesn't make a ton of sense that they would have a completely different... (laughs) Power matrix. Who designed these things? The Cardassians. <laughs> Somebody deliberately sabotaging Starfleet. Neelix and Cass barge into this meeting with Neelix insisting they should be part of the senior staff. Neelix's self-importance here. <laughs> it's very annoying. <laughs> but eventually Janeway does agree. I kind of like that. I thought that was funny. I was thinking, can you imagine Picard or Cisco in the situation and what <laughs> they would have done? I mean, Picard would have not had it. Okay. This was a misstep on the part of Janeway. She is in an unknown area of space, and she's not bringing in their basically local knowledge. Neelix has traded across the sector. He has clearly a very good memory for where people are. I feel that in this situation, you would want to bring in whatever local knowledge you have. Well, I mean, I agree when we're talking about exploring different parts of this sector. Yes. But what we're talking about in this meeting is promoting different members of staff to different positions. We're talking about repairing the ship, which Neelix doesn't know anything about. I would agree that maybe it's something you do, you bring him in for his section or something. Yes. You know, you bring him in like an outside presenter, something like that. But the reason I say that I don't think he belongs there is that when you are at the senior staff level having these kinds of meetings, you might be talking about something that until it is public, it's not public. Right. Now, 
Is Nilix able to keep his mouth shut? I don't think we know the answer to that question. We don't know that one yet. Yeah. And if there's no sort of briefing about you know, how to behave in these meetings, meaning the stuff we talk about in here stays in here, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But I think you at least have to brief him. Yes. But I would be cautious about just dropping somebody because you don't really know yet if you can trust him. Because remember, in the very first mission, he betrayed them in a way. He lied anyway. In a way, yeah. He was misleading. I don't think I would be comfortable going, oh, yeah, come on in. Listen to us talk about everything. Maybe he's really infiltrating the crew. It's a risk that you would have to take. But at the same time, I'll counter with Tom Paris was in there and they just sprung him from a jail for his anti-Federation standpoint. So that's kind of risky. And on top of that. Yeah, but she reinstated him to Starfleet. You, he's either reinstated or he's not. You can't be halfway reinstated. Yeah, she did give him a field commission. You can buy his loyalty, but it doesn't really guarantee you'll have his loyalty. I would say, here's my other point. The most important thing here is, this is unknown space. You won't go very far if you fly into an active war zone. Your repairs or your staff promotions won't last very long if you get the ship destroyed. And Neelix is the kind of guy that you'd need to do that. Is this how Voyager's going to go? Every time we stop somewhere, I'm going to hope we leave Neelix there. And you're <laughs> going to hope that he becomes part of the senior staff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to establish a baseline of how it's going to go with Neelix. My opinion on Neelix is complex. He can go between annoying and almost like you're just adding this guy in as comic relief to yeah. he's actually a good character and a good part of the crew. He's a bit too much comic relief for me. Uh, yes. I will admit I'm leaning more towards that Neelix is actually someone who's useful. Hmm. I'm leaning more towards Nate on Ted Lasso. Ah, oh. <laughs> it's kind of like how on the Deep Space Nine podcast, we talk frequently about the moments of comedy weren't always appropriate, especially yes. when it came to the Ferengi. And I feel very similar with this character. I just yeah. think he's a bit goofy and he hasn't quite, I mean, we're only in episode three and he just, he hasn't quite found his place yet. Yeah. To me, he just, he just seems a little annoying and I don't understand his value yet because he hasn't really offered much. Yeah. The value that he brought in episode one ended up just being so he could get his girlfriend back. It so relatively useful. I just haven't seen it. Yeah. Well, Kess does helpfully suggest creating a hydroponics bay to grow their own food since the replicators are down. Janeway assigns this project to her, which seems to make her happy. And also Janeway must be thinking, this will keep you busy for a while and maybe out of my way. <laughs> and Neil exclaims he can cook to help out as well. And all the while, Tom Paris is standing behind him, like making faces. Every time <laughs> Neil is talking... <laughs> Oh, these two are not going to be friends. It's very funny. Yeah. When discussing the personnel situation and the lack of leaders in different departments like medical and engineering, I felt like we were being pretty cavalier about how everybody died like last week. Right. You know, we just sort of swept that under the rug. Oh, it's, they're gone. Big deal. That's my note right here of like, so we lost the engineer and the transporter chief <laughs> yeah. amongst everyone else. That was so last week. Yeah. They could have at least introduced them, so I, I could have commented on, don't get attached to them. Well, they could have shown, I don't know, maybe it's too soon, but we could have had a funeral or a memorial service for all the people who died. I mean, geez. Nah, they just dumped them out the airlock. Yeah. Chakotay gives Janeway a list of Maquis personnel he thinks would make good officers, and she's immediately surprised to see Bailana on the list after the incident in engineering. This is great. The complete look of surprise on her face. This is... Starfleet Janeway going, oh, what? It's the Janeway maneuver, as we established last week, when yes. she's telling you a lot of things just with her eyes and her face. Yeah. <laughs> Try yeah. not to be a huge Janeway fanboy, but this is an actor who gets this character so well and has the skill to actually make it work, literally from day one. Yeah, you get no argument from me. I am very quickly remembering why I am a Janeway fan, even though I haven't watched this show in 20-some yeah. years. We also talk about the holographic doctor only being able to operate within the confines of sickbay. So Janeway assigns Tom to study as a field medic with the doctor. He wants to protest, but the ship is suddenly hit with some kind of a jolt and everyone runs to their stations. And we get the first, it's some kind of spatial distortion. <laughs> In this episode, yeah, we got a lot of that last week. On the bridge, one of the Maquis, who is a Bajoran, but wears no earring, by the way. Maybe we'll find out about that later. <sighs> Bajoran atheist. We knew they existed. Oh, she's a follower of the Paul Wraiths. She says they've encountered some kind of spatial distortions, and these distortions are coming from a highly localized disturbance in the space-time continuum. 
I love problems with the space-time continuum. <laughs> so the ship stops, and we get a look at a Type 4 quantum singularity right in front of them. And then they receive a distorted audio transmission from within the singularity, and they see that there's a ship, but it's too distorted and too far away to really make out. Janeway tries calling the ship, but gets no response. They try to figure out how to rescue the other ship from the event horizon, and Chakotay calls engineering, asking Belana how to get the ship out of the event horizon. I paused the show here just for a second to take a note, and I caught Janeway giving Chakotay this wide-eyed look of irritation yes. without saying anything, and it's the Janeway maneuver again. That look on Janeway's face, priceless. Belana proposes a subspace tractor beam, and Chakotay tells her to get to work on it, but Janeway then asks Lieutenant Carey, the ranking officer in engineering, yeah. the guy who Belana punched, what he thinks, and he agrees it might work. So Janeway puts Lieutenant Carey in charge and quietly asks to see Chakotay in private. Well, Janeway says, we have a problem. She did not appreciate Chakotay just sort of going over her head and calling Torres directly in engineering. Oh, yeah. He makes a bunch of excuses, and Janeway points out that he needs to treat the Maquis as if they're part of the crew. Chakotay says she's not making it easy by not giving any of the Maquis crew members senior positions, and she wonders how she's supposed to ask her crew to accept any of the Maquis as senior officers. Yeah. But honestly, this is probably something they should have thought about before, but here we are. <laughs> well, I think it's a very fluid situation, so it's almost yeah. an emergency situation, and they're making decisions on their feet very quickly. Right. Janeway does make a really good point here about Starfleet protocols and the training of the officers. Are these marquee people up to snuff? But I would add to that, hasn't she considered training some of the most able marquee to Starfleet standards? So you basically rush in an emergency officer training school on the ship. Because if these people are competent marquee officers who are good at what they did, then transitioning to following Starfleet rules might be a lot easier if you train them. Well, yeah, and you could set it up as like training for, you know, the officer level positions. And so right. then you would find out which ones were interested in it. Although maybe none of them at this point would apply. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, I would think some training is what's needed. And the same would, I would think, would apply to the Starfleet personnel. Not all those Starfleet personnel are on an officer track. Yeah. And throwing someone into that situation isn't necessarily going to help. Yeah, good point. Well, Chakotay says that she put him into a senior position, but she points out that they accept Chakotay because he graduated from the academy and he has actual Starfleet experience. And then he asks to speak freely and says he doesn't want to be her token Maquis, which I do understand the sentiment yeah. and respect his right to say that in this situation. Right. I could see him feeling like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He admits he still thinks of the Maquis as his people and he thinks that they need someone to support them. This is where I took a note where, in this scene, Robert Beltran keeps rolling his tongue around in his mouth, and it's very <laughs> disturbing. It's like, I can see you doing that. Why are you doing that? Yeah. Chicote says he's trying to help her, and he's sorry that she doesn't see that. He recommends that she at least get to know Torres, and then abruptly asks for permission to leave. Yeah. And she says, dismissed. What I really liked in this is Janeway, the whole body language and the look on her face is like she is absolutely furious. And she is just that close to actually blowing up. And she is just holding it back. And she really gives this impression of like, just that one bit further, I'm going to snap your damn neck. And I'm pretty sure that there's a step or two that she goes up when she gets into this office <laughs> so she can remain like at eye level yeah. with everybody. Otherwise, maybe Chakotay would tower over her. But I'm pretty sure there's one or two steps here in her office. I definitely think this conversation is necessary. Yes. I think Chakotay needs to get his attitude in check a bit, though. He's not quite as calm as Janeway is. No. But tough conversations have to happen between leaders, but you have to keep your head. Right. You don't get what you want by raising your voice, right? I tell people this all the time. It can certainly be difficult, and this is a difficult situation because their lives have completely changed yes. because yeah. of the situation that they're in. So it's not like a normal conversation you might have, you know, at the office in the kitchen or something. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But I do think when she's complaining to him about the other people from the Maquis, about their inability to control their tempers, he's not going to win an argument by losing his. Agreed. So I don't know. I've, it's sort of like Chakotay, even just up to this moment, he's all over the place. He starts off snapping at Tuvok, yeah. and then he kind of snaps at his own crew. And then he's actually really good with Belana, sort of matching her energy and turning it yeah. around. Yeah. We're just up and down. This is a huge change for him. He's gone from Starfleet rules to Marquis back to yeah. Starfleet. 
So this is a roller coaster for him. So I could see that being True. almost a realistic portrayal. Perhaps, again, in defense of Chakotay, when he calls Balana, he's used to being in situations with the Marquis where their lives are on the line. And he's calling the person he knows he can trust that can get them out of the situation. Well, what an opportunity to say that exact thing. Oh, yes. I mean, to the... just to just sort of take a step back and say, oh, yeah, my bad. This is what I normally would have done in the same situation. Yeah. But he doesn't do that. He goes in double, triple. It's like <laughs> he could have easily had that conversation. At the same time, in the Janeway Leadership Corner, we have to look at Janeway as well. She did the absolute right thing to take that conversation into a private location. Yes. That's yeah. the right thing to yeah. do because then you're not showing that you have faltered in your faith in your first officer, right? You take that privately. But she too has to realize that she needs to incorporate the Maquis into all levels of the crew or she risks them banding together. Right. And causing a mutiny or plotting against the Voyager crew in some way. Yeah, you need cohesive crew. Yeah, you have to give them meaningful roles and show your faith in them. Yeah. This, I thought, was a, a really great scene apart from Chakotay's tongue. That, <laughs> I didn't like that. But otherwise, a really good scene. In sickbay now, Kess turns up to ask the doctor for some soil samples to start her hydroponics bay. And here we get to see the beginning of the relationship with Kess and the doctor where she's treating him like a person and he's sort of taken aback by it. She's definitely the first person to do that. Yes, I like that. We also see his ego on full display when he says he's the embodiment (laughs) of modern medicine. (laughs) Oh, that made me laugh. Oh, you know, this is another thing. Douglas Adams, Marvin the android who complains about everything. That's what I'm thinking with the doctor. Brain the size of a planet. He asked me to open a door. Well, they chat a bit and she notices he seems to have shrunk by about 10 centimeters since she first came into the room. Also a nice production touch there. Yeah. When you see him in front of the shelf, his head is above the shelf. Yes. And, and then, then when they below. change the camera angle, it's below. Yeah. And when he sits down, he's like sunk down in this big chair. Yeah. Well, he confirms this and he calls Harry in operations for help, but Harry's too busy to help with that problem. He just basically brushes him off. And kind of rude. They are rude to the holograms in this one. Well, I mean, that's what they get back from the hologram, so it's only fair. Before leaving with her soil samples, Kess does ask for the doctor's name, but he says no one ever thought he'd need a name. And then she thoughtfully ends the program and leaves with her little plastic things of dirt. Yeah, that's not a lot of dirt. No, to start a whole hydroponics bait? No, I thought that was very funny. It's like maybe 10 tablespoons of dirt. (laughs) Back on the bridge, we tried the new subspace tractor beam, but you know it doesn't work. I mean, it's way too early in the episode for something to work. (laughs) And Voyager starts getting pulled into the singularity. There's a lot of techno babble in this episode. Oh, there really is. They really embrace it. So Janeway asks to lay in a course for a nearby system called Illidaria to see if they can get some help. Who are friendly, mostly. Yeah, that's what Neelix says. Now we go to Janeway asking to see Belana, and she wants to know if Belana thinks she's ready to be chief engineer. Specifically, she wonders about her ability to command the Starfleet personnel who might have hard feelings about her being promoted. Yeah. As Janeway tells her about the difficulties for her in taking the job, Belana gets pretty defensive, but Janeway says she's just trying to figure out if she's right for the job. Janeway's been reading her record from the Academy, and I really love her when Belana asks, where did you get that? I mean, has she heard of computers? I mean, it was very funny. It's like, what do you mean, where where does she get that? Yeah. Uh, I'm a captain in Starfleet. Well, we learned that Belana had numerous disciplinary hearings and a suspension. Not a surprise. She is a Klingon. Belana says the system didn't give her a chance to breathe. And Janeway says this is the same system we have on the ship. But rather than just answering Janeway's question about why she left the Academy, Belana gets defensive, insults Starfleet, and stomps out. This is not how you get the job in a job interview. <laughs> no, not good interview technique there. She seems to have a lot of resentment. That's the main thing here. She really does. She seems to also have a bit of a chip on her shoulder. Yeah. Back to the Janeway leadership corner. I think she handled this conversation well. I mean, she told Belana why they were talking. She was honest. But she wasn't quite prepared for the defensiveness that came up really quickly. I thought Janeway was being very conciliatory towards her. She was, although she did poke sort of right into the sensitivity. Yeah. It's hard when you don't know a person, somebody you just met, and then to start poking right away at something super sensitive. You have to be yeah. prepared for the fact that that's, that might cause them to overreact. At the same time, she needs to know if Belana can keep her head in a difficult and stressful situation. And Belana showed her here, maybe not. Maybe she's not able to. Right. That's a very important thing, considering what happened at the start of the episode. Right. Well, now the doctor calls and his shrinking problem, which amuses Janeway, is getting worse. <laughs> yeah. It's like she needed something kind of funny at this moment. 
But also, he's not just shrinking. He's, like, weirdly distorted because he's all wide across the screen. Right. I don't know. That was a weird choice, I thought. I think they should have just stuck with him getting shorter. But every time they showed him, he was more and more distorted. They had an effect box, and they were going to play with it. That wasn't very good. <laughs> He's actually called to tell her that there's lots of weird problems going on with the crew, like dizziness and headaches. And she tells him about the singularity, and he complains that no one informed him of the nearby singularity. Janeway agrees to keep him better informed, but she leaves the conversation abruptly without warning. Right. And uh, when there's another shake of the ship, and he's like, hello? Hello? <laughs> Again, this is something you wouldn't necessarily even think of, of including the medical hologram, because you would have a medical officer in charge. Yeah. I think an important part here is the learning curve. Yeah. But it does make sense that the medical officer should know right. what's going on. And if he's the only person they've got, they're going to have to keep him informed. Yeah. Now on the bridge, we think we've run into a new singularity. But oh no, in fact, we never left the old one. <laughs> we try a bunch of things to get away from it, but it doesn't work. And Janeway says she's going to do her own analysis on the singularity instead of, you know, throwing it over to Data and Jordy and drinking tea in the ready room <laughs> like uh, Picard would have done. I thought that was really funny. Oh, yes. This did feel so TNG. The scene or this moment with Janeway? The scene. Yeah, I can see that. She says she wants reports from all the senior officers, and Chakotay suggests that they let Belana into that conversation, if she's still being considered for chief engineer, and Janeway gives him a fine. I think if you have a really skilled person, even if they are not the chief engineer, you need them in there. Oh, absolutely. I don't think you stick on protocol if your neck's on the line. No, you need solutions. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Right. Now in engineering, Lieutenant Carey tells Belana that she'll be attending the staff meeting with him. And then unfortunately, he also sort of snootily tells her that he speaks for engineering and she shouldn't speak unless spoken to, which I thought it was super rude. But also she created this problem when she punched <laughs> him. So I don't know. I don't think I might be that conciliatory towards someone who just broken my nose in three places i do like how on this show you know by episode three here we've created this drama between crew members yes but so as not to lose that sort of roddenberry ideal of how there wouldn't be any drama between the people within yeah. starfleet or you know there wouldn't be any conflict it's like we've made these people outsiders so yes. we've sort of given ourselves an excuse yeah so that we could have the conflict. Yeah, I don't know. It's clever. Right. Until a week ago, they were actually enemies. Isn't this something that we learned in that Deep Space Nine documentary about Michael Piller? Wasn't he one of the people who, and I think Berman as well, who defended the original Roddenberry vision? And that was one of the challenges they had with Deep Space Nine. So it's almost like, because now they're the producers and I think the writers in this, maybe not this episode, but in the first episode, but they're at least the producers here on this one. So maybe you yes. know, they're trying to sort of bring it back. Well, I think that was one of the reasons why DSN managed to be what it was, because they were more interested in this show as the natural evolution of TNG and Roddenberry's dream. Oh, so when these guys moved away, yes. like in season three, then Deep Space Nine became what Ira wanted it to become. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting because it, yeah, it definitely got stronger from there. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Next, we see Harry telling Tuvok a bunch of gossip about the Maquis and Starfleet and engineering. I don't know why you would tell a Vulcan <laughs> about such things. I mean, this maybe enhances how young Harry is, but Tuvok is like, ugh, humans. Okay. We have to go into overanalysis here. Uh, okay. You see with Tuvok almost an irritation, which Vulcans aren't supposed to have. And Tuvok even says, I will never cease to be amazed at the human capacity for hyperbole. And seriously, when he says that, you can clearly see he's irritated. And yeah. I think this is a great portrayal of that side of the Vulcans where they're all high and mighty. Oh, we don't have emotions. We don't suffer from emotions. <laughs> and then turn around, right around and show emotions. We see this in portrayals of Vulcans within Deep Space Nine, the baseball episode. Right. where this Vulcan had gone for decades enjoying poking Cisco, yeah. And then in the final scenes of it, he's clearly annoyed and irritated at Cisco and his team celebrating. And I think this is, again, another one of those examples of the Vulcans being high and mighty, but still underlying a lot of these things are emotions. Right. And you can see it in Tuvok in this scene. I think what the logical person misses here is this isn't necessarily about the hyperbole yeah. or about the things that Harry is saying, but this is a normal part of human interaction to sort of have a conversation, build some rapport, yeah. 
That wasn't going to happen with Tuvok. So maybe a little bit of a lesson for both of them. Why do humans always talk about the weather? (laughs) Yeah, got to chat. Well, anyway, Harry goes down at this point with a splitting headache, which usually is a terrible sign on television, but we never mention it again. He's fine. (laughs) He's in the very next scene and we never even talk about it. Yes. At the staff meeting now, the doctor has shrunk even more and he reports more people having weird symptoms. Janeway asks for some opinions on what to do. Eventually, we get to Belana, who very calmly suggests that the problem with the doctor's holographic projectors might give them a clue. Janeway is immediately excited by this because she was thinking the same thing. Belana says if the spatial distortions are interfering with the external sensors in the same way, they could try to dampen the distortion around those external sensors. I also like this because you clearly see how Janeway is the engineering captain. Right. And I can really relate to that when it's a subject area where you're an expert on or have been an expert on and one of your people is working on it and it, all of a sudden it's really interesting because or you get excited by it because it's like, oh yeah, I know about this. They know about this. We can work on it together. And it's like being able to dip back into a technical side that you maybe spend a long time not working on or being away from. Yeah, this is that great moment when you're at the whiteboard and you're both like connected and solving this problem. There's yes. nothing else going on around you. Uh, oh, no. exactly, exactly. Janeway is super excited by this idea and she dismisses everyone. When Chakotay is leaving, he looks back smugly at her and she smiles, realizing Belana is a good engineer when she's not punching people. <laughs> yeah. Now on the bridge, we start playing the communication from the other ship and working on removing the distortions. And eventually we clean it up enough to hear that it's actually Janeway's original message that she sent earlier in the episode. And we realize the other ship is actually Voyager. Oh. And they do this dramatic pause into an ad break. (laughs) And I get like absolute Star Trek goosebumps in this moment, right? This is such a Trek moment. I really love it. This is very much where the show is different from Deep Space Nine and more like the next generation. Well, they even do the zooming up towards her face as they go into the break. But also the music. Deep Space Nine would rarely do that sort of haunting music, which turns it almost to sort of sci-fi horror. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. That's something that they use on TNG, something they use here. Even though Deep Space Nine is maybe known as the one that is more atmospheric, it's a different kind of atmosphere that's very consistent. Whereas on TNG, we would do that same thing where we just play this sort of haunting, scary thing in the moment because we have to add peril to the particular episode. Right. Whereas DS9 had the peril of the war hanging over the whole thing. So it was just very different. Yeah. Back to the conference room, because that's not great news. And Belana talks about the other Voyager being sort of a reflection of themselves, like being at the bottom of a pond and looking up at yourself. Yeah. This is a time-delayed reflection. And Janeway is thrilled that they figured it out <laughs> while everybody else is sort of freaking out. That, again, another funny little piece of the technical captain, the excitement at this phenomena and witnessing it. Rather than the horror of we're stuck and have, what was it, six or nine hours before it destroys the ship. Right. It's almost like that original series thing where Spock would see something that potentially was threatening and his reaction would be fascinating. Or even on Prodigy, there's some moments with that character Zero where he too would just get excited about something that was (laughs) happening, something really terrible that was happening. And we would think, oh, they're like Spock. Right, right. We do get a little speech here from Janeway about temporal mechanics and how it can be confusing because Tom tries to explain something. She's like, no, you're not making any sense because (laughs) sometimes in temporal mechanics, effect can precede cause, which cannot make normal sense in your logical brain. Watching that, I felt a parallel to the end of TNG where Q introduces Picard to the concept that future events can travel backwards in time right. to impact the past. And I like this sort of idea coming up again here. Right. And of course, I have to say the immortal words of Mars O'Brien. I hate temporal mechanics. <laughs> Belana and Janeway now have their moment as they're doing some very <laughs> excited close talking while they work out a way to get out of this mess. And nobody else at the table says anything (laughs) as these two are finishing each other's sentences and they work out that the key is to find the crack in the, like in the ice on the pond, but really the crack in the event horizon that they caused when they first entered. Yeah. And Janeway in this scene, she spins around, marches back to the bridge (laughs) to release some warp particles into the singularity to try and locate that crack. This was very techno babble heavy scene. Agreed. Star Trek science. They do find the crack, of course, but it's too small. Janeway is now in her element. It's a science problem. She's confident it's solvable. Yep. And Bilana's like, that's too small. We're all going to die. But that was quite <laughs> funny. 
And eventually, she ends up in a shuttlecraft with Baylana to get closer to the opening in order to emit some kind of a beam to open it more. Yeah. But before that happens, we do have to pause briefly to tell Tom that he's too dumb to be the one in the shuttle. And that <laughs> does also make me laugh. <laughs> Maybe not the smoothest delivery of that message, but, you know, she wasn't wrong. He was the wrong person for the shuttle. Okay, I'm going with 99%. This is just because Janeway wanted to be the one doing it. Oh, she totally did. Yeah. She's so much more like Kirk than Picard, yeah. Tom, your hair's wrong for this mission. Uh, I'm going to go. It clearly says in the instructions, somebody with a bun. They would not have succeeded if it had been Belana and Tom. <laughs> On the shuttle, we mix in some real conversation into the work that they're doing. Yeah. And shockingly, unlike season one of Deep Space Nine, two women in a shuttle aren't talking about boys. That's quite a departure, isn't it? It is actually quite a contrast. Especially when one of them was usually the science officer. Yeah. Belana apologizes for losing her temper in their earlier conversation. She says Janeway was hitting a little too close to home. She thinks Chakotay is wrong and she isn't officer material. She quit the academy because she realized she just couldn't make it in Starfleet. And she said no one was sorry to see her go. Though Janeway tells her that she had more friends at the academy than she realized because there were professors who supported her being allowed to return. Belana did not expect that. Yes. But back to work and we emit the beam and we get the opening to open a bit more. And then when we try to head back to the ship, we see two voyagers, the real one and the reflection. Belana and Janeway briefly debate which one is which, with Janeway overriding Belana and telling her that the one she thinks is the right one is actually the reflection. Yeah. And fortunately, Janeway picks the right one. There was some great delivery from Roxanne Dawson in the scene when they first see the two ships and she completely flat says, well, this is a problem. <laughs> and then yes. later on, when she makes the comment about, if you're wrong, we'll have a long time to debate it. <laughs> Almost, you know, that dark humor like Mars O'Brien would have. Mm. And there was that moment, actually, I think it happens twice, where Belana thinks she knows which one it is, and Janeway just reaches over and stops her from, <laughs> yes. from pressing the button, like, yeah. no, no, wait a minute, we have to talk about this. Yeah, I have to say, I love the scene. This might be my favorite scene in the episode. Yeah. I had the moment where I was like, can't they just, like, shoot at one and see if it's a reflection? I mean, yeah. wouldn't that have answered the question? But then I thought, well, they're probably too close to that opening. It, they'd probably give some techno babble reason why the whole thing would blow up the ship or something. <laughs> but anyway, I like this scene because Janeway hears Belana out, right? Yeah. Before oh, yeah. she makes her decision. And Belana now has this moment where she has to trust in Janeway, and she does. And they go with the captain's idea, and, you know, they're fine. So it was a great scene. Agreed. Well, now when we get back to Voyager... Janeway, once again, marches out of the turbo <laughs> lift. She is so hilarious. In two steps, she can show that she's in an urgent situation. I, she's got this weird skill. We talked about this so much on Deep Space Nine, where everybody's always walking slowly. Yeah. And somehow Kate Mulgrew has figured out how to make every step that she takes look urgent. Because we talked about sometimes the hallways were just too short for them to be running. Right, I mean, right. in Discovery, they have these long hallways and they can run. But on the station, they didn't. Well, Kate Mulgrew's got the same exact situation where she's only got one or two steps to take. But she does this thing where she just like waves her arms and just like showing that I am running, <laughs> right. even though I only have two steps to take. It makes me laugh every time. Like, remember the one where the reactor was about to explode and they've got to crawl through those tubes and things. And oh they're my trying God. to get they're to They're going it. so slowly. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, why oh. are they walking? That was funny. But yeah, I get it. The way Janeway walks with determination. Yes. It's so much in the first episode and it's so much here. Yeah. Well, Janeway now tells everyone that we're just going to punch our way through this hole that may not be big enough and get <laughs> out of here. Shields are down. Everyone's flying all over the bridge, but Paris flies Voyager through the opening and everything is fine. And Janeway gives a little Janeway maneuver here smirk at the end. Yes. Now in engineering, we learn that Belana is indeed the new head of engineering. Yep. Chicote gives her some encouragement and leaves her to get to work. And Belana starts barking orders, but everyone just looks at her until she says, please, which was really <laughs> cute. She has a brief exchange with Lieutenant Carey saying she's going to count on him. And he shakes her hand and says, I assure you, you'll never get less than my best. That was very magnanimous of him, I thought. I mean, I guess we're to believe that she's earned their respect at this point, though I'm not sure it would be quite that easy. Oh, OK. In defense of that, mm -hmm. Carey also actually congratulates her. I feel this is 100% Roddenberry Trek. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. I'm just saying in reality, it might not be that easy. <laughs> but yes, this is the Roddenberry Trek. Right yes, here. he... Mm -hmm behaves like the evolved human of good job yep. you are a good engineer and takes it like you say magnanimously and i really did like that and i think it's an important part of this episode showing that starfleet accepting a marquee 
and the marquee member stepping up to the Starfleet standard. And we did have that moment in the staff meeting earlier where when Belana brings up that maybe the problem they're having is related or similar to the problem with the doctor's holographic projection. Yeah. Carrie says something like, is this really our priority to talk about the doctor? But of course she was right. Right. And Janeway was right with her. And so I, I think maybe he had to eat a little bit of humble pie <laughs> and be like, OK, you know, maybe she does know what she's talking about. Maybe I should be listening to her. Agreed. And he, to be fair, he probably was listening to her before she punched him in the nose. I can really change your opinion of someone. Right. On the upper level, we find Janeway observing this whole scene, and she tells Chakotay that two crew members have already filed complaints about Belana's promotion. I love that. It's another little Janeway smirk there. She says she may be in for a tough period of adjustment, but she's going to make a fine addition to the crew. And then Chakotay asks if the situation were reversed and they were on the Maquis ship instead of Voyager, would Janeway have served under him as captain? And she says one of the nice things about being captain is she doesn't have to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was awesome. Yeah. And then down for a quick ending in sick bay where the doctor is the size of like a doll standing on his chair. And Tom comes in and says he likes him better this way. And the doctor is not amused. Pretty cheesy little effect there. Yeah. Oh, very cheesy. The end. I am just going to say that was a great episode. Do you have over analysis? Yes. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Did Janeway give the right answer to Chakotay at the end? I would think to build that cohesion and get trust of Chakotay, the answer should have been, oh, absolutely. We need to get out of this. I would have totally worked as the executive officer to show Chakotay that if the situation is reversed, she would trust him. Even if it's not true, it's building rapport. Your thoughts as a leader, Kim? Well, at this point, I guess at this particular moment in time, I don't think a little levity is a bad thing. Ah, so you think she's playing it for humor. Okay. Yeah. I do, and I think he knows the answer, that she would do what was necessary to save the crew. Ah, uh, okay. I read that the wrong way. So yeah. I took it lightly, I guess. I took it as more serious. Well, that's how you read it. Next one. Janeway telling Balana about the professors who would have supported her return to the Academy. Is this true? Or is this a manipulation technique to get Balana on her side? Well, I'm going to say it's probably true yeah. because... Belana would have access to that info now. Oh. So unless she was prepared to fake it. Yeah. And I guess the fact that she named one of the professors. Yeah. At least that part was probably true. So, I, I, but I'm also going to say it must have been true because Janeway didn't give up on the idea of Belana being the chief engineer. Yeah. So maybe once she really had studied it. Oh. You know, that file. Gotcha. She was like, oh, maybe there really is something here. Yeah. Let me give her another chance. She just needs the right environment. I think it was true. Okay. I mean, she could have overstated it, but I think it was true. <laughs> I would agree with that. I yeah. might do that. <laughs> she embellished it. Look, you got to get the most out of people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think you'd have to be pretty cautious about embellishing because she maybe wants to see it. Yeah. Like, I really, I'm going to need to see that letter. It better be there. <laughs> yeah, I'm having Tuvok type it up right now. <laughs> oh, give me a minute. Give me, <laughs> give just a minute. give me a couple minutes. I'll go get it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Next thing, yeah. Janeway. I think an important part of this episode is Janeway learning how to deal with the Marquis against her Starfleet training. Maybe this comes down to how I see Janeway. Certainly in season one, I see Janeway as a textbook Starfleet captain. She got this advanced ship. She got this mission because she is a by the book, very capable captain. And as such, I kind of see it really makes sense of her taking this point of, look, these people aren't Starfleet trained and then coming around to, OK, maybe we can make this work. Her, you know, having to learn this isn't also a part of this episode, as well as Chakotay having to come back into the Starfleet fold. Well, it's not like she got any training on doing this exact thing. Right. It's not like there were classes at Starfleet Academy yes. or that she's ever gone through it before. So, yeah. Integrating pirates into your crew. <laughs> yeah. How to deal with eye patches and people saying, ah. <laughs> so you do see it as like a learning experience for Janeway. Oh, 100%. 100%. Even just her conversations with Chakotay, I think, yeah. were quite a learning experience. And she seems well capable and well interested in adapting. Would you think that, and this is, this is headcanon here, Someone like Janeway is a captain who is being groomed for the Enterprise. Oh, 
That's actually sort of depressing because, yeah, probably she could have been on the Enterprise. <laughs> right. Instead, she's stuck with these sunburned, terrible hair guys <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I would see Starfleet having a cadre of top flight, by the book, adaptable captains yeah. that they would be putting into positions to see if how good they are. And I think the fact that Janeway is given advanced tech in a ship with a dangerous mission is a pointer to the type of captain she is. I mean, is she by the book? She's going on the away missions, and Picard rarely did. Was it a different book on Enterprise? Yeah. I think because she's probably at, still at that stage of her career. Yeah. I mean, I've always looked at Janeway as Kirk with Picard leadership skills. Yeah. That's always the way that I've looked at her. That's a good description, yeah. So she would make a lot of sense as the captain of the Enterprise yeah. or of the flagship. But I find that thought really depressing <laughs> that she missed her opportunity to be the captain of the Enterprise. Next thing, short one. The Doctor at this point does just appear to be effectively a comic relief. I mean, they don't have a Wesley, so the Doctor's filling in that comedy role. Well... I would say Neelix is more that. Really? We don't know what the Doctor is yet. The Doctor is, he's funny in a different way. Yeah. He's a little bit more cutting. I see him as the guy who's going to make the pratfall. Oh, no. I would say Neelix is the pratfall guy. Really? Because he's more goofy. The yeah. Doctor's more like the straight man or the sarcastic person. Yeah. But he's also perfectly capable of doing his job. I was almost going to compare him to Quark, but that's not right. I, d I wouldn't compare him to Wesley. Yeah. I don't know. I did, because Wesley was competent in what he did. Yeah. And the Doctor is too, although we haven't really seen much of anything yeah. yet. He can fix broken noses. Maybe it's too soon to say. I think the Doctor is the character that, in a re-binge, you see, I don't think they had his arc planned out. Yeah, probably not. Maybe they didn't know how popular he would be. Yeah. And that wraps up my over-analysis. Over to you, Kim. I don't have a lot. I mean, my first note is that this is such a TNG episode. <laughs> It's probably why I liked it so much. <laughs> it reminded me very much of Times Square. Which one was that? That was the one where they find Picard in a shuttle and they're oh, right, right, like right. a time loop. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a really good decision to do like a normal sort of self-contained episode yeah. as the second one or the third one. Rather than being overly focused on getting home. You and I know we talked a lot when the show first started of was every episode going to be Gilligan's Island where they just about get home. So I think it was smart here that they didn't focus on that. Yeah. And yeah. instead, it's almost like we were trying to establish that this show is more like TNG, not Deep Space Nine. Yeah. I just think that was a good decision, I guess, at this moment with this particular episode. Yeah. The programming choices, I think, are very interesting. I think the first episode combined a lot of DS9. Yeah. So they were trying to bring in the DS9 audience. And then with this episode, I felt we jumped right into TNG. The sort of the techno babble and the science problem mm. and what is essentially a very much a pure sci-fi story. Right. Like you say, you're bringing in a TNG audience here. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We appeal to the DS9 folks who are obviously watching DS9. And we also try and bring in the TNG people who are probably now really hurting for a fix of TNG. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure I was. It's a smart move. And I feel with this episode, and it's not a criticism, you could literally replace Janeway with Picard and you would have the same episode and the same <laughs> beats. Uh, I don't think so. It would be similar. <laughs> yes, I would agree to that. Janeway and Picard would have been pals. Yeah. Oh, definitely. They would have been good equals. I can see that. I'd like to hear from people who watched both shows when they aired. Yeah. I mean, I know you're one of those people. <laughs> I wasn't watching Deep Space Nine when this was on. So I'd be curious to hear how did other people feel about that? Did they feel like it was like scratching a different itch? Yeah. Or is it just more Star Trek to watch? I definitely fell under it's more Star Trek to watch. Yeah. Okay. Which might not be a surprise. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go on to Women in the Future. I've already sort of talked about the women in the future earlier. I mean, a key difference between Deep Space Nine season one and this show is that we're showing women involved in solving a science problem, you know, without being sort of stuck in a stereotypical box. So I definitely like that. And I also think that so far we're doing a really great job of not letting Janeway's command 
her skill in command, yeah. not the official command of Starfleet, but not letting that wane. Yeah. Even in, we've shown her in some really stressful situations and we've shown her still being completely competent, still being completely in charge. I can't say that this is always something we've done on Star Trek. So, you know, so far, it's hard not to just love the character of yeah. Janeway. And maybe that's what this podcast is going to end up being. Is this going to be a love letter to, <laughs> to Kate Mulker as Captain Janeway? I don't know. I honestly didn't know what to expect. But so far, that's what it is. So I should make a note that maybe by season three, we change the podcast to the Janeway Love Fest. The Janeway Love Fest. Yes. I mean, you were a Cisco fanboy. And now I think maybe I'm the fanboy. <laughs> I mean, we can go to the Janeway leadership corner. We talked about leadership so much already, but Janeway, again, just showing that she's a great leader. You yeah. know, there's, there's not that much else to say. That was actually not true with Picard in episode one. Yeah. I mean, he had a disadvantage, the actor and even the writing of the character. There was a disadvantage in that the only Star Trek we had up to that point was the original series. It was quite different. But, right, right. you know, at this point, as the things we've talked about before were what they're probably trying to do with Janeway with this show. She was probably given sort of a, a leg up, I guess, yes, yeah. in the situation. I like the way she was skeptical of Belana, but she was professional. And eventually they had that breakthrough with the two of them. Yeah. Though, realistically, a breakthrough like that, you know, could take months. But, but anyway, it's a TV show. That would have been a very dull for a season, I'm afraid, Kim. Three episodes of them just working on a whiteboard. Yeah, that would have been quite boring. <laughs> but all right, we talked plenty about leadership. I think we can just go on to rating. So what is your rating of this episode? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral? Absolute thumbs up. Great Star Trek episode. Great Voyager episode. I think we saw a really good building of some of the foundations that make Voyager a good show. The question of the Marquis and Starfleet working together. Your point hits the nail on the head of we brought in outsiders into Starfleet, into the ship. So we get that conflict. Yeah. Great idea. The episode itself is a classic Star Trek science fiction an event that they have to fix. Also, their motivations are really interesting as well. Of, of It's, again, very Roddenberry, very Trek. They're trying to save a ship that's stuck in a quantum singularity. Yeah. So a great Trek episode and some great performances by Janeway and Tuvok. Definitely a thumbs up. I agree. Total thumbs up. After sitting through seven seasons of Deep Space Nine with yeah. the previous podcast, it's not that I didn't like that show. I did. By the end, I was a true fan of that show. But slipping into Voyager, it's like putting on a comfortable <laughs> shoe, you know? It's like, yeah. oh, yeah, this is, the, this is the place I like to be. I'm very happy here. Feels very good to be here. But on top of that, there's that moment when you realize the other ship is not another ship, it's Voyager. Yeah. And I got those little goosebumps. <laughs> and I, I mean, I wasn't kidding. Those are total Star Trek goosebumps. It's like, oh, yeah, this is what I love. That's awesome. <laughs> it's Voyager. Yeah. So, yeah, very happy with this episode. I'll totally give it a thumbs up. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. at the end of this season, what our ratios of thumbs up, thumbs down are going to be? Well, we will find out. <laughs> It was under 50% of the first season of Deep Space Nine. But to be fair, I'm not sure what it is with TNG. TNG season one, not great. Yeah. Okay, that wraps up season one, episode three. Come back next week for episode four. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com. We are also on Threads, Instagram, that thing that used to be called Twitter, and we're also on YouTube, all at Rebinge It. You remembered YouTube. I did. You can check us out on Facebook as well at facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 